You'll notice that Brother Denham obfuscated, waffled, and ran from my argument concerning the law in Acts chapter 21, verse 20 through 24. Now, Brother Denham, was Paul a spiritual adulterer? Just answer the question. Give me Acts 21, 20 through 24 first. Uh, Scott? Now, I made an argument, and I want you to deal with it. I want you to go to Romans chapter 7, and I'll answer that for you. By the way, Romans 7, 4, they were being married. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, so they were a spouse. Okay? So the marriage comes in Revelation 19, 7. They weren't married yet. It was the espoused. In the Hebrew reckoning of things, a young damsel stayed in her father's house. And that father's house was crumbling. Judaism was, was crumbling as the body of Christ was being raised. At the marriage, she was then presented, not uh, for the destruction of the church, for Jesus now to divorce the church, but to marry the bride. And so his reign would last forever. We have a fulfillment of that today. He's still, got, he's waiting, for, he's still waiting for marriage now. He's not married to the Lord yet, according to his doctrine. We're married today. Now, he did, not, he did not answer this argument because he cannot answer it. It cannot be contradicted. It cannot be vitiated. It can't be weakened in any way. I call this argument the trilemma of the law. Now, notice. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. We find James and the elders of Jerusalem. They come and they see Paul. Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, now watch it, they are all zealous of the law. You remember how Ananias was chosen to baptize Saul, <coughs> a man who was devout according to the law? How is that possible? Because as Jews, they followed the law as their civil law. That's exactly what they did. Now notice in verse 21, they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. My brother Denham, he said, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. Now, if he believed that the law had ended for him and the other Jews, he should have said, that's exactly what I teach. I teach them not to circumcise anymore. Teach him not to walk according to the law. That's not what he said, brethren. Now watch. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. This is a vow according to the law, is it not? Is that not the Nazarite vow? Take them, take, and purify thyself with them. According to the law. According to the law. He purifies himself according to the law. And be a charges with them that they may shave their heads. Exactly what they did at the end of the vow. Same thing in Acts 18.18. 18, when we have Paul, uh, I believe, shaved Apollos' head at St. Korea. That's what I think was going on there. And all know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Now, was he a spiritual adulterer? Please answer my question, Brother Denham. Now, there's three possibilities. He is either ignorant, or he is arrogant, or he's a faithful Jew and a faithful Christian at the same time. Right? He is not ignorant. Give me Romans 15, 31. Now please notice the force of my argument. It will not be contradicted. It will stand. Paul writes that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. Now Brother Denham's a good enough Bible student to know 
that that service was accepted in Acts chapter 21. In verse 17, where we were received gladly, we find that the text telling us was an important time in church history. It was the first time there was open fellowship between the Gentile and for the Jew. Separate to that time, they viewed themselves as a separate body, but God was bringing them together. 60 A.D. Book of Romans, written 58. So he writes the book of Romans before he does this. He is not ignorant. Acts 20, 26, and 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, pure from the blood of all men. He is not ignorant. He writes the book of Romans before he goes to Jerusalem. He goes into the temple with charges. Apparently he pays the charges for the four others. So not only does he involve himself in Jewish sacrifices, he pays for others to do it. So he's fellowshipping them. He's participating in their worship. Now he's not ignorant. He's not ignorant. <coughs> You did cite Acts 23, verse 1, that he had lived in all good conscience before God. Well, okay, I think I heard that he did. All right? I think he did. We'll go back and find on the tape. I'm pretty sure that he did. But even if he didn't, Paul said that in Acts 23, verse 1. I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. So he wasn't a hypocrite. Okay? So what he's doing here in Acts 21, 20 through 24, he does with a pure conscience. How is that possible that he keeps Jewish charges? How is it possible that he does this not being ignorant and not being arrogant? He is a faithful Jew and a faithful Christian at the same time. The house had Jewish elements in it. And that law was being destroyed. Now, as a Jew, as the light of Christ was being revealed, they would follow Christ. They wouldn't be dominated by the law. So as the light increased, they would recognize what parts applied and what parts did not. So in Acts chapter 10, verse 1, 10 to 12 years after Pentecost, the Lord comes to Peter and says, Rise, kill, eat. What does Peter say? Not so, so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. The Lord rebukes him three times. Why does Peter have the idea? And so did the rest of the Jewish church because when that signaled that the diet laws had changed, the Gentiles would come in. God is now gradually revealing the truth. So give me 2 Peter 2 now, 18... Uh, 2 Peter 1, 18 and 19. All right. This voice which came from heaven we heard, but we are with him in the holy mount. By the way, when in this particular context in Matthew 17, he made known the coming. In Matthew 17, we find Jesus and Moses and Elijah transfigured, and they saw the nature of the coming, the spiritual coming of Christ. The law and the prophets would go away at the coming of Christ. That's exactly what he was saying in Matthew 17. Now look now in verse uh, 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed as a light that shines in a dark place. That darkness was passing away. 1 John 2, verse 8. It was the last time. 1 John 2, 18. Until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. This is the fullness of Christ and the revelation. They can scoff at it if they want. It's the face-to-face -face meeting with Christ in the revelation, in the day of revelation. That's exactly what he was saying. So there's a transition period that's going. Give me the New King James in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, please. Verse 11. 2 Corinthians 3. It's the same thing. It's the transition period. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Is this also from the law's perspective? Brother Denham, remember, ignorant, arrogant, or faithful Christian, faithful Jew. 
You see the force of implication. I want you to deal with that when you get up here. I'm, I'm wanting the answer tonight. It's passing away. Now, therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Verse 13. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, so the children of Israel could not steadfastly end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For unto this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when it turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Lord uh, is there is victory. But we all, now watch this, please, with open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, are being changed into the same image from glory to glory. Now Paul says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It's not a miraculous change at the end of time. It's a spiritual change at the time of the end. The change was coming. The transition was coming. They didn't know what they would be yet. We see through a glass darkly, but then face to face shall I know. Even also as I am known, the face to face meeting. If you can see the truth in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12, you can see the truth of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. And the law was passing. So for the 40-year period where the miracles were given, it's the transformation of the old covenant people. As the body was dying of Moses, the body of Christ was, come, was giving it life. Give me uh, the body. How much time do I have? About eight and a half minutes. All right, give me the body, please. The body of sin. Now the ancients were wont to talk about a corporate body, kind of like the political the philosopher Hobbes, the body politic. In Isaiah 7, 8, the Bible says the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason, and so on. The head of uh, Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Romalia. All right? Head body. The ancients were wont to talk about a body. Now there's an individual element and there's a corporate element as well. Let's keep on going now. So in baptism, we find that the body of sin is destroyed. That we should not henceforth serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now as you're baptized into Christ, you became dead to sin, but not from the responsibility to keep from sin. Now in covenant, you're given in life. The body of sin is being destroyed. Let's go on to the next one. So he says, let not sin reign in your mortal body, but you should obey in the lust thereof. Now the mortal simply means subject to death. That's all that it means. And he says, neither yield your members. Now we understand the members in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. The body is one of your many members. Paul is representing himself as an old covenant man who's transitioning. So he tells the Romans, don't let sin reign in your members. He's not saying don't let it reign in your fingers and your toes. It's not the physical body at all that he's talking about here. All right? Now you're the body of Christ and members in particular. It's the same motif. It's the same theme. Paul is not talking on different levels. It's the same level. Keep on going. Romans 7, 24 and 25. I see another law warring in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity the law of sin, which is in my members. He's not saying in my, in my feet, in my hands, in my toes. He's representing himself of old covenant Israel. He's in the transition period. There is a law in the members. All right? Wretched. And so they're trying to keep me into captivity, the law of sin, which is in, in, in my members. He is not a schizophrenic. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He says, I thank the Lord Jesus Christ. He was doing it. He was delivering him from the body of death. Not the physical body, Brother Denham. It is the spiritual body. So he says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is not of his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. There's an individual element and a corporate element. We are part of a body that's transitioning. So the body is dead because of sin. That's old covenant Israel. The spirit of life is giving it righteousness. It's beginning to live. Now keep on going. Give me the next uh, phrase. Isaiah had predicted, Thy dead men shall live also together with thy dead body they shall arise. 
Awake and sing that dwell in the dust. The dew, the dew of herbs of the earth shall cast out her dead. It's the type of resurrection. Old covenant Israel is being resurrected. And finally it will come when the earth and Hades being done away with. And the marriage thief is there as well. All right. Five minutes. Now the sufferings of this present time are not to be compared with the glory about to be revealed. Now, Brother Daniel, pay attention here. You've got to understand this. Art and Gingrich, mellow. Look what they say. Here's the scholars. All right? To be on the point of, to be about to, apocalypse and I, about to be revealed. Now, that's Art and Gingrich. It was about to be revealed. Okay? What? The sufferings of that present time of the body. So that body of the humiliation, the body of the sufferings of, of, of Philippians chapter 3 was about now to change. It is a corporate body. When Paul says, with body do they come? He's talking about a plural uh, a pronoun in a singular subject. Alright? That's another issue, but that's the concept at the same time. Ryan and Rogers, Melosin, present participle, coming, about to be. Flash to Bruno, mellow with the infinitive, expresses imminence. Keep on going. Alright? Because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Now here is the old covenant body being transformed. If this is the physical, physical, physical creation, then what? The physical creation will be then delivered into the glorious sons of God? That's not the idea. It's the corporate body. Give me the next text. Not only ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, those with the first century Christians, even ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the body to wit the redemption of our body. Notice, plural pronoun, singular subject. All right? They were sealed with the Spirit till the day of their redemption. That's what Jesus referred, is the same, I referred to. It's the same kind of redemption. Now, to whom was given the redemption? Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption. Now, notice, the adoption of the body to the redemption of our body. God is not going to adopt your physical body. You don't need your physical body redeemed. It was the spiritual body as you partook of the body that was being redeemed. God's not going to redeem your hairlines. <laughs> he, won't, he won't do it. He's not going to redeem Brother Denham's gray hair, though it looks very stately and um, very debonair. Uh, I, he really is a good looking guy for his age. <laughs> and, however, that's not what needs to be redeemed. It doesn't need to be redeemed. It's the inside that was re redeemed. Now give me Ephesians, uh, give me Ephesians chapter 1. One of the important things to see the prolexus, the already but not yet of Scripture. Ephesians 1 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Who has redemption? This was the church being redeemed. Okay? Give me verses 13 and 14. All right, 13 and 14. In whom also you trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also you having believed, you were sealed. That's the miraculous sealing of the Holy Spirit of promise. And we'll never get the Holy Spirit straight until we get our eschatology straight. We've got all these indwellers all over the brotherhood because they're saying, well, I'm sealed to the day of my redemption. No, they were sealed to the day of the redemption. We have the completeness of salvation today. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption, what? Of the purchased possession. The purchased possession is not your physical body. It's your spiritual body. You're a member of the body that was being redeemed. Now look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Look what he says. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's the church. The purchased possession. They were redeemed. They were waiting for the day of redemption. They were saved. They were waiting for the day of salvation. They had grace. They were waiting for grace to be revealed at the last time. It is the already but not yet of Scripture. It's the process of redemption that was coming. And He would appear a second time without sin unto salvation. The picture from Romans 6 to Romans 8 is not about a physical body. It's about a spiritual body being transformed. And when I say the resurrection, I mean resurrection life of the body which is being transformed. When the dead ones were raised, when the Hadean world was raised, 
At that point, the body was completely transformed because the law ended. Now, Brother Dan, when you get up here, Acts 21, 21, 21, verse 20 through 24, he's either ignorant, he's arrogant, or he's a faithful Jew and a faithful Christian. 